yeah, keep going, Randall. What else are you watching? Um, oh God, you know we're watching the uh, the Tiger King. <laughs> uh, Let's and that. That's right. My um, actually, I took a break last night and watched the new uh, launch of uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which is the first uh, 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 po or post not post virus uh show but you know everybody on there there was no live audience everybody was six oh, feet wow. apart well it's actually you know a good analogy for for a lot of the writing process you know um and uh i can we can get in this a little bit later but you know a lot of times you will come to uh forks in the road in your structure in your you know in the late act two or whatever and you think god i could go this way but then I could go that way, and I you you get paralyzed by the you know become literally a deer in the headlights by the choices that you could possibly make, and you extrapolate them out and think God you know and you don't want to make the wrong the wrong um, choice because oh a million dollars is writing on your script that's that's exactly right but. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's really important for writers to learn to really to trust that intuition, you know, and to go ahead and take the chance. I think we're rewarded for taking chances now more than ever. You, you can't afford to be bland. What would be the best thing to watch as an example for how to do realistic dialogue? Gosh, you know, like Cameron Crowe, just about anything by Cameron Crowe is amazing. Um, uh, anybody else have suggestions? Realistic dialogue? Um, there's Richard something Linklater. I, just I, I love Richard Linklater. Uh, Wes Anderson can sometimes be too clever, but I love his stuff. Yeah. But I think Richard Linklater is a very, very honest. The Big Sick is a great example of realistic dialogue. I think that's what made the movie. It was so real um, in terms of their responses. And it, it was funny, but heartbreaking. Um, it's a good question, Jacqueline. What about uh, Better Call Saul? Vince Gilligan. Oh, yeah. Better Call Saul. He's terrific. Yeah. I started Gilligan. to watch Revenge again from the beginning. I'm sure everyone's very impressed by my amazing choice of watching Revenge, <laughs> the soapy show. <laughs> I didn't know you watched that in the first place. Yeah. I watched it when it first came out, so like 2010 or maybe even before that. And I'm watching it again. And I really enjoyed it because it seemed like there were going to be two like really strong, there were lots of really strong female characters. And then I was listening to the opening section and it says literally, my dad gave me the path so I could wreak revenge on everything. I was like, no! <laughs> now it's still like the, you know, the dude that kind of worked out the revenge. Um, so now, now she would be able to work out her own revenge, you know, if it was written now, uh, the female protagonist. Yeah. ISA presents a webinar with International Screenwriters Association. My name's Max Tim. Chris, do you want to just announce to everybody while we're waiting for some more people to jump in? Why don't we just remind everyone where you, they can find us online everywhere? Yes. Hello, everybody. Make sure to follow us on social, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our handle is at Network ISA. Um, I think it's in the chat, but I'll put it in there again. We're doing giveaways. We have all sorts of info on there. You can learn about our newest events and you could possibly get some free stuff. So follow us. And we have a YouTube channel that you should all be checking yes. out. A lot of oh. those videos um, are also on our pro tips and tricks, but Scott, are they a little different sometimes? They mix and match? So first off, subscribe to the YouTube channel, ring the bell, do all that other stuff you always hear uh, being advised. Um, but also on our pro tips and tricks page, which is networkisa.org slash pro tips. Um, we also have some third party videos on there. So Film Riot, A Closer Look, Just Right, TED Talks. Uh, so there's more outside third party stuff on that uh, page as well. I think regardless of the current situation worldwide, we, we're moving toward this level of event uh, promotion as much as we could anyway. We do a lot of our or used to do a lot of our live events called Third Thursdays. We also have a virtual Third Thursdays now that we're converting. This ISA Presents uh, event that we do on Zoom is gonna be virtually every week. You just have to pay attention to any newsletter announcements that go on. You can subscribe through our site. And then obviously, um, last but not least, Craig, who founded the ISA. Welcome, thank you for creating this for us, Craig. <laughs> I just wanna um, support what they were saying about pro tips. There's a lot of other free resources on the site including articles and advice, and there's some podcasts. So in your downtime, everybody seems to have a lot more of. If you don't want to be writing, 
no one's forcing you to write, take some time for yourself and just listen in on some of the podcasts is great information. But also a reminder that uh, because of all this free time, producers are looking for content and pretty much every day we're having another producer reach out to us asking about content. And we've been posting a lot more writing gigs on the site. So if uh, you have completed screenplays, list them on the site, go into your My Screenplays, uh, we'll build a profile, list them on your screenplays, to add your success stories and your awards so you can really stand out. We do read all the success stories. They get listed in a queue uh, behind the scenes. And uh, so we're looking for great uh, success stories to post on our spotlight. Felicity goes through all of those. And uh, if we see that you have award wins and some great things happening, that'll get you on our radar. But submit to writing gigs because producers are looking and we're actively, with all of the time that we have now, the extra time that we have, we're spending all of it digging into um, the content. So look for, there's gigs, uh, inspirational dramas in the million dollar range, budgets, survival thrillers, dramedies, rom-coms in the African American community. <clears throat> crime and mystery. There's a lot of, uh, there's a couple companies looking for European crossover films that are set in the UK and all over Europe, as well as uh, we're looking for writer directors like Greta Gerwig or Damien Chazelle. So if you have an original idea and you're a director, make sure to submit to that gig. And also animation is very popular right now. Um, we have a connection with somebody who is um, very active in that area. So um, definitely get onto the site and post your scripts. You have to be a upgraded connect member, but for $10 a month, you can list all your screenplays and submit to all of our gigs. So um, anyway, lots of great stuff on the site and I'll thank you, Randall, for doing this. We really appreciate your time. And I like to hear everybody's stories, you know, like their own, how did I get my start? Kind of where did I come from story? So why don't we just start from there who are you? What got you into this industry? Why are you, we still doing this? You know, obviously because we still love it. And we'll just kind of go from there. I'll, I'll try to encapsulate it in a two or three line pitch. <laughs> sure. Uh, the log line was, as I, is that I uh, grew up in the San Diego area. I actually, um, Legoland, it's actually it was Carlsbad when I was growing up, but, uh, Legoland came in there and planted their flag. And I just say I'm from Legoland now. Because <laughs> I don't know where that is. Um, and I grew up, uh, I actually grew up on, on the Twilight Zone and short stories of Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Robert Block. I, I just, um, I loved all that. Um, but I, I started writing at a very early age. I was particularly prolific in the third grade. Uh, fifth grade was another great year. <laughs> and then um, um, I, it became pretty clear as a, a lot of my friends, a couple of whom are, I think, watching uh, today, they were math geniuses and science geniuses, and I was uh, not in that, uh, that company, per se. So I, I love to write, um, and I love to draw and paint, and that was another thing, too, that was kind of vexing me a little bit, was I wanted to illustrate. Uh, I was very interested in becoming, I, I wanted to be like N.C. Wyeth and, and uh, draw and paint these, uh, you know, um, spectacular scenarios and stuff. It was really uh, uh, an ambition of mine for a while. Then I, I got a job uh, in my writing for my hometown newspaper and I was writing sports. Um, and I thought, well, journalism is going to be it. Um, and because I really loved music, I started thinking that, wow, the, and the goal, the brass ring for me was to uh, write for Rolling Stone. Um, yeah. wow. And, uh, you know, it's interesting now that Cameron Crowe, you know, he was only about 30 miles south of me when he was uh, undercover uh, for um, doing his, uh, what would become Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Uh, scenario. Uh, but, you know, that was, uh, that was a big inspiration for me, music and writing. And I thought, how cool would that be, like to go to rock concerts and meet musicians and write about them? I yeah, that was really it's, it's like almost famous. 
Yeah, yeah, well, it, it really was. And, and Rolling Stone at that time in the mid 70s had just this incredible uh, lineup of writers. Um, and they were, you know, in the, in the tradition of Tom Wolfe, they were, uh, they were um, practicing the new journalism style. You know, it wasn't dry reportage. There was a lot of sometimes really snarky and very, very funny editorial commentary right. that was coming through. Uh, and that really inspired me a great deal. Um, but um, uh, by the time graduation came around, I was mortified because I wasn't sure which direction to go, whether it was still art or whether I wanted to write or then if I was going to write, what kind of blah, blah, blah. And I was, I was a little bit of a deer in the headlights at that crossroads. I went to my local community college because I decided to stay at home, get some more experience on the newspaper and then maybe figure out what I wanted to do. And that first year at community college, I, uh, I took a, a playwriting course, which was like, wow, drama. How, how interesting yeah. is that? And then um, I took an introduction to the cinema course. And that, you know, that's where you saw Woman in the Dunes and Citizen Kane and- Federico you know, Fellini. Yes, and The Seventh Seal, you yeah. know, La Strada, all these things, you know, but it, it, it hadn't really occurred to me. It's like, wow it actually takes people to write a movie. And, and, it, and the whole notion of screenwriting just sounded like a very highly specialized, almost avant-garde kind of writing that I thought was very cool. It wasn't, right. no, I'm not just a prose writer. I'm not just a, sh I don't just write short stories. I screenwrite, you know, right. or and, and I just liked the sound of it. So I started looking into film schools, which were very limited in those days. There was really just four. This is, you know, 70, 1978 or so, and I really got serious to looking around. It was UCLA, USC, NYU, and uh, AFI. There really wasn't a whole lot more right. choices at that time. So I couldn't afford SC. New York was too far away. Um, I didn't know that much about AFI, but I used to go to basketball games at UCLA, so I went with my dad. Uh, we would go up and see basketball games there with um, Bill Walton and the, yeah. the John Wooden years, which were great. And right. it just seemed like a natural place. And my father worked for the UC system as well, so there was a kind of a little bit of an inroads there. And I got into the film school at, there, and that was it. I moved up. I, I started my junior year in the, in the film department. And at that time, there was no difference between the graduate and undergraduate programs. So I immediately started jumping into some advanced writing courses um, almost, almost immediately. Um, so the Rolling Stone situation okay. and the journalism, that had to have then helped move you toward working on the doors, right? I mean, how did you get that assignment? Well, it did, you know, um, I mean, well, first of all, Ray Van Zarek and Jim Morrison both went to film school at UCLA. And when I got there and started in, fall, in the fall of 1979, there were still a couple of instructors there who had had them as students. Uh, so they were, one was actually a, a, an early screenwriting instructor of mine. It was like beginning screenwriting. And uh, the other was the editing uh, teacher, Ed Brokaw, who was in, in, had an encyclopedic knowledge of film and the craft of film and whatever. Um, so I had contacts. I, I, after, long after I graduated, I came back to work uh, uh, to interview them. Um, and Brokaw was amazing. Um, you know, he walked me out to the old, where the old film school was, which was a Quonset hut in the early 1960s. <laughs> and he started walking off the dimensions for me because now it was, it was just sort of a park setting, you know, right next to the North Campus Eatery. And he walked off the exact dimensions of it. He, he painted this virtual picture for me exactly where the equipment was and all this. And it was just, it, it was really terrific. And he ended it all with saying that um, there was a porta potty outside the the Quonset hut that serviced the film department. <laughs> and he said that um, on the inside of that door, somebody had written a graffito that said, Jim Morrison has the ass of an angel. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, years, uh, sometime later, when they leveled the old Quonset hut, um, obviously the porta potty went with it, but the door to that porta potty ended up in the new lobby of the film department of Melvitz Hall. That's amazing. And, and was there as a kind of a relic for a number of years until somebody ripped it off. What I would give to have that porta potty door. Right. <laughs> you don't say that very often. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. That's exactly right. But to circle back, I got, I, I, I graduated in 82. Um, I had a little flirtation with a script that I wrote right after. I, I wrote three scripts at school. They were all awful. One was okay, but basically all three were, were pretty bad. And I had, it, I had set the goal to that I got to write something commercial. And I wrote a horror film when I first got out of school. I gave um, that first summer and I gave it to a friend of mine who had gone through school with me and he was aspiring to be a producer and was in fact working for a real producer at that time. And the guy read it and loved it. And suddenly we were, you know, uh, we were on the road to getting uh, the film produced. They paid me, wow. they paid me $2,400 to do a rewrite on it. And then those days it's like, woohoo. That is man. Yeah. That's a, Man, you know. Um, so from that point, did you like find well, representation after that? Did, yeah. did you feel like, yeah, my career is now going to just take off? Well, right, but therein lies the moral of the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, uh, oh, I did the rewrite on the script. We had Judd Nelson starring in it. Um, we had a director in about two weeks before the start date of the film. I get a call from the producer and said, um, the, uh, the film is no longer moving forward. And mm -hmm. I said, what? You know, and they said, what happened? They said, the money's gone. It just, yeah. it's gone. And so uh, that was a lesson to me right away of how volatile and capricious the business is. Uh, and I, fortunately, I learned a, you know, a really good lesson I, without having a whole lot of at state other than my pride because I quit my job thinking that I was off to the races and my career had indeed begun and I actually had to go back and get get my old job back which was really humiliating um, <laughs> uh, and uh, but they gave it back to me and I continued to work until I got the next round but long story short that script made it into the hands of another old friend of mine that I'd gone to school with and he was now reading scripts in the mailroom of William Morris and he read it and said, dude, this is really good. Um, I'm going to, I'd like to give it to some other young agents at Morris. Is that okay? And I said, sure. You know, he said, you can't believe the stuff that I'm reading. That's so awful. And these people are getting actually paid really good money. You should totally be making money as a screenwriter. And it was really nice to hear because I really felt like I was, I don't know, I just wasn't going to make it. Um, we so all that, need that validation. It, there was at least validation oh, totally. that you're doing something right. Oh, totally. You know, it, it just put a lot of gas in the tank. Um, and so I, I was signed and they started putting me out, uh, sending me out on meet and greets, you know, and, uh, and there were a lot of people that I really didn't connect with at all. I can still remember some of these meetings that going into these, these offices that were like just a little too perfect and just a little <laughs> too fashionable. <laughs> and um, and I, I didn't get a sense that people loved movies or stories that much. It was really all about kind of like how good do I look and how awesome is my office and things of that nature. And I, was, I took a meeting with an independent company called Vista Productions. And I still remember to this day uh, walking into meeting the executive there, a, guy, a wonderful guy named Miguel Tejada Flores who is also an Oregon resident now, and I still work with. Hmm. But he was behind his K-Pro <laughs> computer and with his glasses down in his nose, and, and his office just looked like a, 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 a tornado had hit it. It was <laughs> just, there were scripts piled high to the wall, there were books and there were toys and stuff all over the place, you know, and it was, and I thought, my God, I, this looks like a madman. And I thought, <laughs> I finally met my people. Yeah, right. You know, it was really great. Um, and so I, I pitched, um, he said, I know Slaughter Alley, which was the title of the horror film that I wrote. He said, I know it's still under option, so we can't 
touch it, but we read it, we really liked it. Um, what else do you have? And because I was attending a lot of music and punk rock shows at that time, I, I just said, punk rockers out in the wilds of Wyoming. <laughs> said, I like that. Come back when you have a story. So I did. And I kept coming back and coming back and coming back and with a little bit more and more and more of a story. And then finally, he just said, okay, I think we got enough. We're going to pay you to write this thing. Wow. And so, and that's what started it. Really, that um, and that was a uh, you know I mean I, I think screenwriting to a degree at least at that time it's a little akin to professional sports, and when you're hot you're hot. So if you're you know you're hitting balls out of the park or scoring touchdowns or you know making a lot of high shooting percentage in front in basketball people want you, and uh, so you got to ride that for a while because you never know when you're going to get injured. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then competition is fierce. Well, and so it's, really funny you, it's funny you say that, Randall, because it's a nice little segue into, into kind of the overall topic of what we're going to be talking about today. And that's how to approach writing sessions, what you do in terms of your writing mm -hmm. schedule. We can you know, get into that. Yeah. Um, but I made a note that I wanted to touch on because while I was working with uh, one of my writers today, I consult writers through my uh, Story Farm consulting company. Um, Shameless plug, you can go to thestoryfarm.org if you want to work with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Um, on. But I was telling the, the writer that it, it is a lot like athletics in terms of, or really any other level of, of an art form that you have to practice and practice, and then you have a performance. And looking at writing sessions, a lot of writers, myself included, we tried it, we, we, we had this tendency to treat every writing session as, a, as if this is our performance. And that then creates pressure, like we have to make sure this is perfect today, as opposed to maybe we give my, ourselves three, four days a week to practice, just write anything, mm -hmm. if it's on the project you need to get done or not. Or then you say, okay, my Thursday or Friday is my game day. And that's when I'm gonna really work on that particular project. And suddenly it becomes like this level of, I'm practicing and then I have to deliver on a particular day and it eases up the tension. So I just, I always love the, the, the sports metaphors. <laughs> I was yeah. an athlete growing up, not everybody is, but it makes sense because there is this level of epic competition. There's no major leagues, or I should say, there's no minor leagues in, in Hollywood. It's either just the majors or you're not playing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in terms of how you have experienced the industry and how you approach your writing on a regular basis, A, how has it changed over the years? from when you were first doing it compared to now in terms of a scheduled uh, writing session or what do you do? Um, well, it's changed a lot. All right. Because I can tell you those, those first few scripts that I did, that I wrote, um, they were on a written on a manual Smith Corona. Right. Right. Okay. And so um, I would, uh, I had to do corrections uh, with liquid paper. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and so a lot of times I would do, a, I, I would write scenes out of longhand and really work them and burnish them and stuff and then go to typewriter. <laughs> yeah. And then, and God help me, you know, if I hit or I left out a word or something like that, <laughs> I'm just like, ah, oh, God, you know, and all that. So it was painstaking in, in a lot of ways. However, there, there was something about that process at that time. And again, this is, this is 1980s gang. Mid, early 1980s, is that it forced you to really burnish and work a scene and get it done and really sharpen it and sharpen it and keep working it until you felt like, okay, it's ready. I've got this, this one done. Boom. And you put it on, the, you typed it out, you put it on the stack and then you kept, and then you moved forward. Yeah. Okay. And, and we don't, you know, in the digital age now, which is a blessing and a curse because you can write and be a prolific writer and just spew all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, you know, <laughs> as much as you want. Um, but you can, there's always a little bit of a feeling like, yeah, it's all right, I'll fix it later. Or it's no big deal. I'm not, I'm not really playing for real here. Yeah. Okay. There's less so of a commitment. Right. Yeah, and all about a little bit of that game day kind of mentality of what you're talking about. Um, long story short, and I mean, 
I, I would I would still very happily accept the digital age versus yeah. liquid paper and, and although right. I, I still hit the keyboard as if it's like a manual Smith Corona. You know? <laughs> right. but, you know, I don't I don't make the little rat rat claws on Formica sound that a lot of really native speakers do or you know on, yeah. I, I I'm hammering it like it's like, like something out of the front page. Um, that said, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of this now is, is about, for me, um, have, it's about the having the freedom to explore and to fail, okay? Um, and it's okay to fail it's in, if you're going to fail, but fail spectacularly. And because it's digital right now, if you get an idea of something like this, you know, don't freeze up and think about it too long. Follow that. And if you hit a dead end, you hit a dead end. Big deal. Okay, you turn around come back and pick up where you left off and fork in the road and go on and take the story in a different direction. But you, at least you can check that particular tangent off. Right. As, as something that was working. So, um, so in terms of a daily schedule, <laughs> um, <laughs> ah, let's, let's say that uh, there's an incredible lack of discipline on my part, you know, um, I, I spend a lot of time in front of the screen. I procrastinate a lot by researching, quote, oh, I can't write yet. I'm not ready to commit to writing yet because I need to research a little bit more. About right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so I will occupy myself that way or another. I've described this before, but a lot of times when I'm approaching a, a project that I, I see it almost like concentric circles and you're circling and circling and slowly closing in on this, on this central nugget of inspiration, of story elements and, and, and whatnot, that uh, finally it just feels like, okay, I've narrowed it down, I've focused it, it is time to start really writing this out. You know, I, I think it's refreshing to hear you say that, Randall, because you've been doing this for 30 plus years, and I think everybody watching needs to hear that, that, you know, we don't all have a perfect approach to this process because there really isn't one. We got to do what's right for us, what feels good. The only problem, well, there are a lot of problems with procrastination and we all deal with it, but it can take over and you can start feeling bad about yourself if you let the procrastination take over. So there does need to be some level of awareness there that, okay, now I know I'm procrastinating. I need to fix that because um, we can use it as an excuse too easily. Well, you can use it as a cudgel to beat yourself up with yeah. all the time as well. You know, why, why aren't you making your deadlines or why aren't you getting, you know, hitting your milestones? Um, uh, you know, and you, you know, be kind to yourself, you know, really yeah. you're, you're a lot, a lot of what we do mystifies the rest of humanity. Yeah. Cause we're yeah. really pulling stories out of the ether. We as writers, as storytellers, um, not to sound overly precious with it, but hell, we go into the spirit world. You know, it's very shamanistic in a lot. You know, totally. We go in there, and we have these we we have these kind of adventures, and we collect these weird things, and we pull them down, and we bring them back to the material world, and we have to ground them in into a story. We have to make sense of it. Yeah. And and this is a process to most of the bean counters of the world that is absolutely of uh, uh, nebulous they don't they don't have any capacity for understanding this kind of no. a process you know no. and so that's why i think it, it's that because it's it's so um ephemeral and people can't actually see what we do except in the final form as a script or up on the screen or something they often wonder do we work at all and well no <laughs> it's a different type of work yeah i used to at one point i got um I got very ill when I was working on the doors and um, I got a case of hepatitis, as I recall. And I, 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 I was re really ill. So I had uh, my parents just said, Hey, come home, you know, we'll feed you and stuff like this. And, and I would literally, I said, I can't take a break because I'm on the, you know, I've got the biggest assignment of my life, my career. I can't blow this. And I, oh, I beat myself up all about it. But I was literally like in a cold sweat, dictating into a little tape recorder as I was <laughs> laying there, whatever I saw and was kind of like, but eventually I started, you know, uh, feeling better and was, was working there. 
And I remember my parents at one point just not quite understanding what I did. <laughs> and I would lock myself in this little den and be in there working. And I remember one night, I think I worked all through the night. And I remember looking at the window, at the outside window, and both my parents were standing there looking in at me. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like a hamster on, on a turnstile or yeah, something. Yeah, like a zoo animal. Yeah, and they were looking at me, and I still can see the look on their faces like, you know, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, yeah, it was just, you know, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. welcome to it, you know. <laughs> well, listen, Randall, we have some questions. We're, I'm going to bounce back and forth. Yeah. Um, there was uh, Katie Bennett, I think, Randall, is one of your students, oh, and, and she's Katie. commenting. She had some nice comments in terms of your process, and um, we have some really good comments in here. It, it, Sadly, all the participants aren't able to see the, <laughs> the comments. We do read them, everybody, if you put them in there. Obviously, if you have a specific question that you want Randall to answer, put it in the Q&A box. There's a little box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Enter it there, and we'll, we'll review those. Um, Rebecca C. Rebecca, we're going to get you on. I'm going to unmute you in a second. But she has some questions about a little bit of, of how to tell stories of, of about music, she'll be able to better um, mm. word this for you, but it's kind of a, a dual approach of the question. So here, Rebecca will put you on. All right. Hi guys. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Rebecca. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Of course. Um, I just, I am a huge fan of music stories uh, like The Doors and like Coal Miner's Daughter and yeah. Walk the Line, et cetera, et cetera. So I would love to hear um, about the process of bringing music stories to screen and what one, what is uniquely different about that genre, but two, how do you encapsulate so much story into just a movie? Yeah. You know? yeah. I'm, I'm gonna mute, mute you again, Rebecca, just but but you can hang tight if I I'll, I'll bring you back. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the, certainly the challenge. Yeah, it's kind of like trying to put a biopic together, whether there's music together or not. It's usually in form of some kind of a light story. Yeah. But yeah, go fire away. Well, a lot of that is, you know, you let, let's use the biopic just for an example. Um, in a sense, you have to establish establish some parameters. You have a two hour, you have two hours to tell a story, right? And a lot of problems with biopics and 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 these in include music movies as well, is that they do the cradle to the grave story. And it, it, uh, it just doesn't quite work because they're always racing. There's not enough time. And so they short change scenes. Or they use flashbacks to, and yeah. It, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, what happens is that the, it's usually so chopped up that it never allows the audience enough time to engage with the character, to really get sympathetic, to identify, to have an emotional connection with the character. Because they're not on there long enough to make it, make it work as they're off to run into the other thing. Um, some of my, of my students who are here will laugh because I, I, I talk about Lawrence of Arabia a lot. And that actually, I, when I pitched my take on the doors, I, I mentioned Lawrence of Arabia, and I think that was, that's what saved me from getting just um, or helped me stand out from the pack a little bit. But essentially, you know, the real life T.E. Lawrence was a very interesting man. And he was interesting before World War I and even more interesting, arguably, after World War I, where he reenlisted in the, in the British Royal Air Force and was under an assumed name and was stationed in a remote base in India where he was working on submarines and designing um, more weapons of modern warfare, okay? And, and it was just, it was, it was crazy, it's really weird. But the story was not Lawrence of India, it's Lawrence of Arabia and David Lean and Robert Bolt and, and Michael Wilson who were the original writers on it, you know, they. He said, no, this is about Lawrence of Arabia. And so it starts with him at the beginning of World War I, and it ends, you know, right uh, during his campaign of, with a little epilogue of, of his death. But they chose to say, this is the story. And yes, it's not the whole story, but it's the story. It's the essence of who this guy was. We're going to focus on that and tell it really, really well. 
I think that's the key there, Randall. It's the essence of the person that's that, right. you, that we need to be presenting. Because I get these questions a lot when I'm working with writers one-on-one. -on -one. They have this biopic or they have an amazing story about someone who lived an incredible life. And if you're able to find the, the avenue by which you can share that person's life, then it could be an amazing story. But too often you try, like you said, cradle to grave, you're trying to tell every aspect of that person. And that person changes a lot, even in their real lives. So you have to find what connected me to the story. Why am I the one to write it? What about this person then do I think is the most interesting and unique? I'm gonna focus on that time period. Like even the TV series, uh, The Crown, they yeah. do go back a little bit in terms of telling the Queen's you know, childhood, but not a lot. They start at a particular right. point, and this is the time period we're gonna be learning about who the Queen is by way of seeing her experiencing that time of her life. So it is, it's, it's a really yeah. good question. Um, and if I may just circle back just for a yeah. second, a little bit about the music side to it. In, in regards to Jim Morrison and the Doors, um, you know, I, I, I had to do a lot of my own research at that time because it was, you know, pre-internet. This is 1986 when I did my drafts of the script. So I had to do a lot of my own sleuthing and tracking down people who were willing to talk to me, et cetera, et cetera. And I started compiling a ton of stuff. But one of the things I did get was the transcript of Jim Morrison's um, uh, uh, session where he went in and recorded all his poetry and writings that were in these uh, these sheafs of, uh, he had several notebooks of just wow. tons of stuff. And and he went in there on his 27th birthday, it was which would be his last birthday. And he went in there without the rest of the band. It was just himself and an engineer and a bottle of booze. Mm. And, uh, and he was determined to put it all down. And this, when I read the transcript of it, I was, I was really struck by it because I felt like this was a guy on, who on some level knew he was a sinking ship and that this was, he was putting down his own last will and testament. And so from that, I said, this is, this is the spine of the movie right here because there was so much biographical or could be interpreted as biographical information in a lot of that writing that I felt this is the, this is um, a, a natural sort of voiceover narrative uh, uh, for us. Um, and I really wasn't interested in telling, um, in showing his death. Um, Oliver added that, because for me, it was an LA story. It was over uh, when he left to go to Paris. Um, what happened over there for sure, we don't know. I'm, and I, I didn't want to speculate that in the film because that's really not, it really wasn't what it was about. So I eliminated that, you know, when I put it. And, and plus the last lines of the, of the uh, transcript was that Jim said to the engineers, hey man, did you get all that? And he said, yeah, yeah, we got it. And he said, cool, let's go get a taco, <laughs> you know? And I, I just love that line. And yeah. anyone, you know, those of us who live on the West Coast or anywhere now, you know, I mean, we love Mexican food, right? Yeah. And, there was just a photograph I had seen of Jim uh, going to his favorite Mexican restaurant, and he's there with a plate of enchiladas and a, and a Dos Equis beer, and he looked really happy. Right. You know, and and so that was kind of the image that I wanted to leave with us, uh, leave viewers uh, with, um, because it was pretty hard to put a spin on a guy, you know, being dead in a Paris bathtub at 27. Right. Yeah. So well, so that was. Um, that, that was kind of like my meaning there. So then from that stuff then led to the songs and then I started thinking about the songs, which door songs could really complement the drama that we're seeing on screen. And that right. those became a narrative. Yeah, so it, you figure out the story first and then, I mean, you have the luxury of having a, a giant you know, suitcase full of amazing songs that <laughs> you can choose from, but then right. you're looking to, to match theme and, and message and all that, yeah. Totally. And one last thing, the three m movies that you, Rebecca, that you did cite, Coal Miner's Daughter, which I just recently saw. Coal Miner's Daughter was written by Tom Rickman, um, who was running the screenwriting department ultimately at, uh, at AFI here in most recently. He just passed away about a year and a half ago. Tom was my mentor on The Doors. They actually offered it to him first to see if he wanted to write it. And he actually knew Jim slightly and met him a couple of times. But he passed, but he agreed to be to mentor another writer. 
And I just want to say that for me as a young guy, I was 20, I was 27, 26, 27 at that time when I got this gig. I was 27, actually. Um, there were a few times where I felt really overwhelmed and really scared. Um, there was a ton of freaking pressure on me at this time to get it, you know, to get this right. And I, I, tons of conflicting reports and information and stuff. And Tom always was a voice of reason. He settled me down a lot of times when I was on the ledge and just say, Hey man, you know, you got this. You're, you're an excellent writer. You're doing this. Everything you're telling me was great. You know, and he just, he was a very soft spoken guy and so talented, you know, and I, so, and if, if, if you guys haven't seen coal miner's daughter, you know, please check it out. It has got phenomenal dialogue in it. And it's, um, and it's dialogue that works well with exposition. It's a really clever, cleverly uh, done and beautifully directed by Michael Apted. But that's fantastic. And then the other was the Walk the Line. I had breakfast with Johnny Cash and June Carter because I was one of the people that they wanted to write their that story. Amazing. And uh, yeah, and because so, after the doors, I was offered like all these dead rock star movies and, and <laughs> yeah. mission movies and stuff. And a lot of it was great. But what was different about Johnny Cash? Is that Johnny Cash was alive, man. You know, and he's like he's like right there. And, yeah, right. And Jimbo was dead. You know, I had that. That was enough distance there, you know, for me. But this guy was right there and June Carter was looking at me with these big eyes, you know, the whole time at breakfast. And I, I, I got a little like intimidated because Johnny was really kind of one of my heroes. And, and, uh, I, I, I ultimately, um, I, I, I passed on it. It's one of, one of my little career regrets. But you were the one who passed on it. They didn't pass on you. Yes. They wanted me to write it. And so why uh, did you pass? You were scared of Johnny Cash. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, scared is not quite r the right word, but, yeah. you know, um, when you get to the bare facts of Johnny Cash's life, it was very, you know, poor sharecropper's son, makes it as a, as a rock star, country star, you know, gets, life gets complicated with liquor and drugs, finds a good woman who, you know, cleans him up and, and you know, it's, a, it's all a happy ending. I felt at the time it wasn't anything that we had, it, it didn't feel fresh on the surface of it, okay? It what, and I didn't have the guts to tell him that, but I wanted, I told the producers, I'm interested in, I, I, in, he's so creative and I wanted to come up with a take on it that matched the creativity of his work. That was, you know, and it wasn't until I saw, I'm not here, the Bob Dylan, movie that Todd Haynes did. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not here. Yeah. With uh, Kate Blanchett. And it's all these different takes on right. Bob Dylan. You know, yeah, these, yeah, they yeah. Just, it didn't quite work, but I thought that is the way to tell the story of Johnny Cash hmm. because the sum was greater than the individual, you know, in, in right. Part. right. And he adapted all these, all these personas, you know, that made it, I, I thought that was just really, really fascinating, you know, a yeah. guy, how a guy would do this. Right. So it, and then it was like, oh crap, that's exactly what I needed to do, you know, with that. So anyway, yeah. but yes, I, uh, let's, I mean, those are amazing stories only because we don't, we probably have maybe had like a half hour to go. We'll, we'll move okay. on to yeah, some other additional questions. We could listen to those stories all day long. Sorry. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to be more cogent. Maura Conlon uh, McIvore has been, um, I, Mike McIver, I, I don't know how I'm saying your name. I, hopefully I'm saying it right, Maura, but she's been waiting patiently. Uh, a different question, but I think it's a good one because we have writers from all over the world. Um, so Maura, if uh, I'm going to allow you to talk here. And thank you, Rebecca, by the way, for the question. Yeah. All right, Maura, go ahead. Maura, are you there? Hi there. Hi there. Hi, Hi. this is really great. And I have a question. Um, not, you know, we're not all in LA, and I'm curious, Rondell, what your thought is. Mm. Oh, shoot. Maura, sorry, I hit the wrong one. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Start over. Sorry, Maura. Unmute. Yeah. 
Hello. Hi yes, there. Hey, sorry, Maura. Go ahead. Yeah. So question about location. Like what if somebody is not in Los Angeles, you know, the whole thing with networking and who you know and all of that. Um, in this day and age, do you feel like that's still as important as in the past with the way we can connect now? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we're in a game changing paradigm shift right now. Um, quite frankly, um, uh, you know, I was chatting with my manager a couple weeks ago when this, you know, the viral uh, virus stuff was was really taking over, and you know, the studios had put a put the kibosh on all meetings, uh, face to face meetings with writers and whatnot, yeah. and uh, I um, until further notice. Okay, so everybody's zooming and they're communicating, and and I think to a degree that once people realize how simple and easy it is and that they don't have to get in a car and drive from Santa Monica to Burbank mm -hmm. to have a meeting at Disney or Warner Brothers or something and spend the two and a half hours or three hours to do that, yeah. they're going to say, you know what, my time is better spent, you know, I, I, I'll live in Wisconsin or Madison, you know, and I can still have the same converse, a meaningful conversation with the studio executive or whatever um, without having to do that terrible commute. And sure, I'll fly out there when you need me and all that. But I, I think once people are really going to start realizing this, they're going to, it's going to open things up a lot. Um, uh, that's speculation and somewhat hope for myself. The reality though is, is that if you're in television, you want to be in LA uh, because a writer's room is, is I think, uh, it's just got a particular unique energy that it's going to be hard to duplicate. I don't know. I would imagine they're they're doing it now on on, on Zoom here, but it, can it have that same kind of energy, creative energy that you get from actually being in in one another's presence? That I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, I would say um, think globally and act locally uh, as well. I mean, it's a big world out there. There's lots of opportunities for um, and organizations like ISA now. You know, you guys are posting stuff from producers all around the world that are looking for material. And they're not necessarily looking for WGA writers either. You know, they're looking for, you know, any number of possible candidates. So um, I think things are changing, you know, at least in the film side of things. You know, it's going to, it's, it's changing a lot. Streaming world, I don't, I, I, I don't know, but I think we're in the midst of something that's going to see a lot of change uh, coming for us. Yeah, um, that's well, my two cents worth. Thank you, Maura. That's a, that's a good question. Um, we we get that a lot. You know, I don't yeah. live in Los Angeles. Do I need to live in Los Angeles? And I think you you did a good job answering that, Randall, because the basic answer is. If you want to be a feature writer, you don't necessarily need to be in Los Angeles because then it's a lot more based on the screenplay. If and when you need to take a meeting, you fly out to Los Angeles, you figure it out. Or now because of this Zoom explosion, um, then you figure it out that way. For TV, if you do want to be staffed on a show, they, you got to be in Los Angeles. And it's going to pick up again someday. The, the only alternative is the industry collapses and it's not going to. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, people are going to yeah. be around. So, yeah, it, no, it's a good question. I, I want to move on to another question Thanks, here Mark. from, sorry, we're going to go to Vaughn. Vaughn is talking about any pet projects you might have. So, Vaughn, here we go. I think you have to unmute yourself before you talk. There we go. Hi, Randall. I just want to say what an honor it is to actually speak to you. This is kind of fun. Oh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> Speaking from my, my personal experience, I've got all sorts of projects that uh, have never actually gotten off the ground, but I wanted to ask you about yours and say, do you have you know, the first screenplay you ever wrote that never saw the light of day, or do you have a pet project that you keep going back to and rereading and saying, no, this still isn't good enough for anyone else to see, or uh, what, what oh, skeletons yeah. are buried in your closet? <clears throat> oh, I have, I, I have a lot of skeletons in my closet and a lot of scripts that have never seen the <laughs> the light of day too. Um, I mean, it, it's an interesting question, Vaughn, because um, you know, like that 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 horror uh, script that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, this was the first thing I wrote out of film school, right? And uh, that I wrote on this on this manual Smith Corona typewriter. Um, 
it still has uh, gets interest. It, it's come so close to being made in so many different permutations that probably half a dozen or more. Um, and it was it was optioned not too long ago, a couple of years ago, by a Mexican director who was really into cars, and we were working on it then. So, um, but then it just didn't quite come together for him. So I, I have a couple other scripts like that too that I dearly, dearly love, but I feel that I haven't quite nailed it and I haven't quite understood why. Um, and it's really frustrating for me because they're very dear to my heart, but I know that they're not good enough yet to get out there. Um, so you're, uh, you're not alone. This is, I think, uh, many writers uh, have this. And, you know, it's a little bit like losing, losing a tooth. You know, your tongue always goes back to that spot, you know, where the <laughs> tooth was. And you're still trying to, like, you know, <laughs> get it figured out and, and fill in that, that space. Um, I think the best, the, the best thing, though, is to let them go. And um, because, you know, you kind of like it, you, you create space, psychic, creative space, so to speak, you know, by doing that and other stuff comes in. And sometimes that new stuff that comes in can inform and provide in, uh, a fresh take on that old material. So I, yes, and that has happened to me recently. And, uh, you know, I may go back and, and revisit Slaughter Alley all over again. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> yeah. Good question, Vaughn. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So we have another question that's a good one. And I know a lot of writers have this type of question. Um, Judy, I don't see your hand raised, but I'll just ask it uh, for her. Um, she's asking, how do you approach writing for, for TV, for Netflix? Um, oh, Judy's hand is raised. Let's, let's let Judy ask this herself. Hold on. Cool. All right, Judy, go ahead. Unmute, unmute Judy. <laughs> Here's Judy, I hope. Here we go, maybe. Judy, if you're able to figure out how to unmute your uh, microphone, I think it's down on the left, left hand side of your screen. If you move your mouth. Sorry, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning to talk. Can oh, you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Randall. Um, awesome um, seminar and um, your energy is great. Listen, I, I'm curious about um, how it is for you as um, a seasoned writer working with Netflix, I understand they're very um, IP grabby. And um, I just wanted to know, you know, um, how that was for you. What, well, I mean, uh, as much as you can say about it, you know, how, how the experience was and what you were working on in Mexico. Thanks so much. Um, I, it wasn't Netflix that I was working on in Mexico. It was, uh, it was Amazon. Um, oh, Amazon, sorry. Okay. You know, but they're both the, the, these ginormous digital deities now. I, I don't call them entities. They're deities, practically. <laughs> the streaming de deities. Um, well, I, I was brought onto the project by the guy that I first pitched my movie Dudes to, Miguel Tejada Flores. Um, and he's very tied into the Latino contingent of filmmakers in Hollywood and in uh, other parts of the world. He had partnered up uh, with this, um, with a, a gentleman named Nico Intel, who's a Argentine a producer and writer. And they created this project together, which is called Narcos versus Zombies. <laughs> and uh, they mapped out eight episodes. They were, uh, they pitched it to Amazon, Amazon liked it. And so uh, we were in development, uh, but they needed um, another writer to come along. And I was one of them. They brought in Scott, um, uh, uh, brother of the guy who created Twin Peaks. Uh, for, uh, for us, and then uh, a Mexican writer as well, who served, um, you know, really with uh, uh, very well with the translation of stuff. But anyway, um, we were uh, left to be to our own devices, pretty much. Uh, the Amazon execs sat in on a couple of meetings, um, but they didn't really come in and, and uh, push us around. Uh, or demand anything at all. And that's the thing that I have noticed at least um, and what I hear from other writers is that the new deities, you know, these, the, the Netflix and the Amazons and whatever, they're, um, they're recognizing the talent of, of the creative teams and they don't seem to want to fix what ain't broken. You know, in other words, they don't meddle. 
Um, at least that's how I've seen it and experienced it so far from my corner. Um, there are other things that in, in which they battle over, and which is always money and budget and, and, uh, and this and that. But creatively, they're, they seem to be keeping their distance and not trying to meddle too much, um, or if at all. So I think that's pretty awesome. Good question. So I hope that continues. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Judy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I think on top of Judy's question, approaching writing for TV versus approaching mm -hmm. writing for a feature, um, right. What's the primary difference? I mean, that could be a whole hour and a half lecture in yeah. itself. I'll, I'll be coaching about that as, as best I can. Um, so I, I've, the, my last couple of, of assignments have been uh, for television stuff. Um, I'm writing a pilot right now, and, I'm, and I finished a pilot uh, late last year. Um, and... And then the uh, Narcos versus Zombies stuff were, were half hour episodes. These other pilots were hour long episodes, okay? It was hour long pilot. Um, so when I first did my first pass at this uh, one, uh, my, my first attempt at the pilot, um, and I was adapting from a memoir, um, my manager immediately said, hey, whoa, 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 slow way down. <laughs> you know, you're driving too fast. And he said, and, went, and I said, what do you mean? He said, you're writing it like a feature. And he said, you got to understand that television, especially, you know, especially episodic, you know, it's a slow, slower burn, you know? And so don't feel compelled to just like race along. Yeah. You want to keep a story crisp and all that, but keep in mind, it's much more character driven and it is, uh, uh, it's not about plot, you know? And so therefore the pace of things is gonna be a lot slower. Still engaging, but slower in that. I've period. been recommending uh, to some of my writers who are, are working on pilots right now, because um, they have this question, you know, difference between feature mm -hmm. and TV. How do I write a TV pilot and everything? And um, a really good example on, uh, I think it's, Oh gosh, it's on Hulu right now uh, with Reese Witherspoon. Um, I think the other actress's name is Carrie Washington, but it's called Little, Little Fires Everywhere. Right. And it's a good example because it's so slow that after a while I'm like, what am I watching? Like, I don't understand how this, <laughs> but I was engaged in every single moment and, and scene. And, mm -hmm. and I noticed that it was because that, it was like 90% character, but then little pieces of plot were thrown in just through character interactions. And, and so you're watching an almost entirely character driven show, um, but you're still engaged. And not that character development isn't engaging, of course it is, but it's a nice exaggerated example for people who are so used to a plot driven movie type of structure or approach to yeah. then trying to flip to TV, because TV, you're right, Aunt Randall, it's so much more character driven. It is, but you know, at the same time, uh, you know, the, then the argument is, is that if you are writing a one hour pilot and you're intending to write eight episodes or 10 episodes and maybe have a second season beyond that, which you're often required to ask, you know, at least what's the second set, uh, you know, the second season is going to be about, um, you start having these, these questions and arguments about like what to include in the pilot and what to save for later episodes you know right. and this becomes yeah. like holy crap this is like drives you nuts sometimes um because you don't want to give everything away in that in that opening pilot but at the same time you have to have provide enough that makes everyone uh want to come back for more right totally yeah so um, I, i'm going to roll back to a to a sports analogy real quick yeah. Uh, Max, which is that uh, one of my favorite quotes is from John Wooden, the great UCLA basketball coach, which he says that, said somewhere in his career, uh, that sports don't build character, they reveal it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is something that I think all of us as, as dramatists need to know that you know we're not necessarily in the character development business. It's not like we're sitting in the toy shop here and building. We're building characters, you know, like uh, like like little uh, 
uh, dolls or you know, the nutcrackers or something. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're revealing them. Okay. And so a lot of what modern, uh, the, 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 the new slate of TV series are all about well, from like Fleabag and whatever, it's about revealing what is already there. Yeah. Okay. And that's what's, that's, what's fascinating. So keep that in mind. And you're going to reveal the, the you know, skin is, is they're like onions, you know, the skin is going to come off of characters, you know, more and more each episode, you're going to find out what they're made of. I mean, look at uh, Breaking Bad. That, that It's in the title. We're seeing the reveal of this man broke bad <laughs> or how he breaks bad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really good question here from Rob Shader. Rob, I'm going to unmute you here. Hold on one sec. Um, we do have a whole bunch of other questions, and, and I'll get to them as soon as we can, everybody. But um, Rob, if you're, if you're ready to go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, assume everybody can hear me here. Yeah. Um, John, or I'm sorry, Randall looks like uh, we're probably about the same age, not looks, but revealing your history there. <laughs> Seems like we grew up around the same time. Um, I was wondering if um, you think that it's still possible for someone my age uh, to break into the business. It's a good question. You know, Rod, I, uh, Rob, you know, um, the, the, Far in my in my mind, of course, from where I sit, I sit now, far too much um, emphasis is placed on youth and all that, and that's always because the, you know, the the driving um, uh, uh, corporations funding all the networks and everything like that are very youth oriented because they want to be hip, they want to be cool and all that, but you know. There are, there are huge demographics out there of people that want to see stories about their own demographic uh, as well. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I, I would kind of say, you know, write what you know and write from our, you know, uh, 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 age bracket. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm actually having a dialogue right now with a couple of young filmmakers and, and stuff, and I'm going to help them with plot and structure and character, but you know, when it comes down to dialogue, writing a lot of dialogue or something like that, I don't know if I'm gonna be the one to actually, you know, put that stuff in there, in, 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 down on the page. There'll probably be a much, I would get rewritten probably anyway because so much of the vernacular has changed and all that. But yes, um, I do think it's possible, um, especially now in the sense that, you know, uh, you're not necessarily having a face-to-face -face meeting with someone. If you write a great script and it places well in a contest or, or comes across someone's desk and they really think it's, it'll be a great vehicle for Reese Witherspoon or Brad Pitt or some other star, um, they're not going to think about it. You know, um, They're going to just get it, try to get that going. And then when they meet you, they may, whoa, gosh, wow, uh, surprise. But um, I think it's totally possible still. So I don't say give up, just do keep trying to do good work. And always remember the writer of uh, the King's Speech, you know, from a few years ago. Boy, did he nail that, hit that one out of the park. Yeah. And one he was the, in his uh, 70s. One of the ISA's first Fast Track fellows, um, Martin Blinder is his name. Uh, we had no idea how old he was. We just read the script and it was great. And we did a little research on him, not really even noticing any level of age. And he was in his, I think, late 70s. And so we met him, we were like, wow, okay, but then he turned out to be one of the most interesting people we've ever met. So the opportunities are there if and when you can deliver a script that people can't ignore. I think that's the best way of saying it. That if they find something that's incredible, they're not gonna say, oh, you're, how old? Never mind. You yeah. know, I mean, staffing on a TV show is a little different because there are certain levels of demographics that people are trying to, you know, source out and, and fit within the room. The showrunner wants this type of voice. But from a feature level, I, I will say that, you know, if, if you write a great script, people are going to find it one way or another. And, and you, it's not like you put your age on the title page. Right, right. But I, I, I would say that there is... Oh, there's ageism. Bias. Yeah, yeah. There's, no, there's no doubt. There, but I, I, it, it just, it just makes me want to prove them further wrong. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> you dang kids, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> right, right. All right, we've got a couple questions that are kind of along the same lines. So, Matt, I'm gonna unmute you in a second. Matt from Austin, um, but oh, cool. Michael, who I awesome. believe uh, already left. But um, 
I'm going to mm. read Michael's and then I'll, I'll let Matt speak. But I do want to just do one little announcement before we get in there, just because we're kind of coming down to the end. But um, thecraftcourse.com. So if you go there, it's $99. If you enter keep writing CC, keep writing CC, Carissa will put that into the um, uh, little chat box. That'll get you $40 off. If you purchase today, you'll be entered into a lottery to hopefully be chosen as one of two recipients to receive a free development evaluation. So that's a read from our team, plus five pages of notes. Um, you can use that at the end of the course if you wanted, or you can use it immediately. Um, but nonetheless, it's a course that I created. It's a 12-week course, video, audio. There's assignments. Um, there's a whole bunch of material on there, and you get to, get to keep it forever. So if you're looking to write something during this crazy pandemic time, um, it's just a nice way to, to so-called procrastinate. There you go, Randall. We <laughs> you can go through a course and start developing a project. Um, so anyway, keep writing CC. Um, you get 40 bucks off. We also have a third Thursdays, a virtual third Thursdays next week uh, on Zoom. Pay attention to the events page at networkisa.org. Um, and then we have a meditative writing class for writers, obviously, um, uh, led by Jess Hines. It's, it's worth 80 bucks, but it's going to be for free for ISA members uh, this coming Wednesday, I believe. Carissa will put the date in there. It's either this coming Wednesday or next Wednesday. Anyway, we've got a ton of things going on. Um, you can check out a whole bunch of things on the events page in ISA or go to thecraftcourse.com and enter keep writing CC and get a little discount. Okay, cool. So let's, oh, I have to go to my question. <laughs> it's, it's weird. I feel like I'm doing a radio show. I don't know if you see Randall's <laughs> video holding up the, it's, um, it's where the Wolfman. Wolfman. It's Wolfman. Yeah. I, um, I find, you know, sometimes that, that when I, I'm using zoom a lot to teach and, and to have, inter, it's a stage, you know, and I've, I, 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 I'm channeling my inner Pee Wee Herman, I think, you know, <laughs> what, what's, what's, Going on. I can't we help it. Bring, so anyway, we should bring a Zoom Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse show. On hey, Randall, it's Craig again. It, what's with the rubber chicken behind you, too? Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. you know, everybody needs one, especially in these times. You know, yeah. <laughs> gets you laughing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me find where this is here. My bad. Um, so Michael, who's who's no longer in the the uh, chat, but. He's asking about your credit on Mask of Zorro, uh, mm -hmm. story by. So what does that mean exactly? Do you write a script as a replace by later, et cetera? Now, before you answer that, um, I'm gonna let Matt ask his question, which is somewhat related. So Matt, hold okay. on. All right, Matt, if you can unmute yourself. There you go, go for it. All right. Um, hey, hey, thank you for uh, doing this, this is great. Thanks. Uh, we were wondering, if you pitched Zorro and you created the script first, or if it was brought to you and then you wrote it? It, it was brought to me, or I, let, let's just say I had to audition for it in a sense, because um, you know, it, it was a, a, a pre-existing uh, IP. Um, you know, it's, it was, Zorro was, a, was sort of a superhero of his day in the, in the pulps. Right. Um, it was created by, that great Latino uh, writer, Johnston McCulley, um, who uh, just, uh, he, he uh, took a lot of the myths of, of uh, California bandits and uh, uh, gold rush bandits and whatnot and created this guy. Um, and so there were a number of written stories before it even uh, started coming to film, you know, they made a silent, Doug, Douglas Fairbanks made a silent film of them back in the 20s. So anyhow, uh, I, after The Doors was uh, out there, um, I got a call from my agent who said, would you like to work for Steven Spielberg? And I said, yeah, and yeah. said, Steven is, is developing um, a new version of Zorro. And are you in, interested in that? And he, and he would like to meet you. And I said, of course, absolutely. So I did, I met him and he was in, in production on Hook at the time and all that. But we had to have a, you know, we had a talk and uh, it was, you know, a memorable uh, moment for me because I actually went to the set and was engaging with him, talking about Zorro as he was actually directing the movie. So he would make, he would do a couple of shots 
and then turn around and, and just pick up our, our conversation as if it had you know been broken at all. It was pretty amazing. But um, yeah, so I had to audition. I had to come up with a story and that's, um, and, and I went around, it took a couple of rounds for me to settle or, or for me to uh, uh, pitch the, uh, the story that ultimately made it to the screen. I was the first of what would be nine writers though, okay? So I did my drafts and he felt, Spielberg felt, who, and by the way, he wasn't making it clear whether he was just going to produce it or direct it at that time. Uh, Spielberg still felt it wasn't quite the script that he wanted it to be. And so um, basically my contract was up and I was issued my walking papers and said, hey, it's been great, you know, we'll see you later. And then subsequently a lot of other writers came and they worked on it and they made contributions and then they were fired and all that. At the end of it all, nine writers, 32 drafts of the screenplay, um, and it went into an automatic arbitration within the guild, the Writers Guild, and uh, they determined uh, what ultimately would be the final credit. So I share a story with Rossio and Elliot, and um, let's see, and I think uh, they share a screenplay credit with John es Escow. And so I hoped that I would get screenplay credit as well because a lot of my scenes and dialogue were in there, but ultimately the guild saw it differently. And, but it's my story. And basically I pitched the old Zorro, young Zorro, the transference, the mantle of, of being Zorro from the young, from the old to the young. It would be really uh, interesting, Randall, to sit yeah. in on that arbitration. Like how do they decide who gets those credits? That's crazy. Well, it's, you know, it's the guild's attempt to be objective, but it's it's really uh, it comes down to a subjective um, choice. I think sometimes, you, you know, when you're dealing with that many things, um, but it helped that my characters kept coming back, you know, stayed stayed through it through it all along, um, and that's why I think I was awarded the credit. Uh, but it yeah, it was. Um, it, it was nail biting there for a while, you know, in terms of whether I was going to, going to <laughs> whether I was going to get credit. And there were some other really, and because of the limitations the guild has, uh, the, only four writers can share a screenplay credit at any one given time. And just a quick thing: any time you look at um, a, a film in which it has been written by more than one writer, when you see the word "and" in between the names. That means uh, the writers wrote their draft separately. And when you see the symbol, the ampersand symbol, uh, that means they, like in Rossio and Elliot, that means they wrote it together as a team, okay? So those are subtle little differences. Yeah, there. I love that. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question, man, I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for asking. All right, we're gonna do a last question. This is a fun one. And just a huge thank you again to everybody in attendance, everybody who was posting comments um, and, and just you know really positive stuff in the comments uh, today, which is, is yeah. normal, but it's just nice to see it. Um, and of course, thank you to Randall for, for being here. This was fun. Well, th thanks for having me, uh, Max. I, I appreciate it. And I, I just wanted to say before we sign off too, I, I just want, I noticed there were a lot of folks from uh, New York, Brooklyn out there. And, um, Big shout out to you guys. It must be rough. And so we're not going unnoticed. So right. thinking about you out here on the West Coast. All right. Well, with that said, last question, a fun note. Favorite book on the shelf behind you? Oh, oh <laughs> man. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, crap. God, you do this to me at the last and minute. I always end it with a question that they're not ready for. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm big on graphic novels, you know, because I'm a visual storyteller. And, and so I'm still drawn to stuff that is very visually driven. This is one of my favorite um, graphic novels, the Charles Burns, Black Hole. It's very David Lynchian in its nature. It's surreal, it's disturbing, it's really weird. 
Um, it's I'm metaphor. A lot of comments, by the way, Randall, of people saying they absolutely love black hole. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. So um, this is, I, I pull this out all the time and just, uh, you know, <laughs> leaf through it and stuff. It's, it's just terrific. <laughs> I find it really inspirational in a very dark and twisted way, but that's, that's my nature. You know, <laughs> dark, right, well, we we nature. get a little uh, inside view of, of Randall's brain. Yeah, I'll just throw it away. Well, thanks again, Randall. I appreciate it. You're a friend of the ISA. We can do this as many times as you want. And do you have anything you want to promote or announce or let everybody know? Um, you know, uh, we're, yeah, I mean, Hey, uh, you know, uh, you can find me online at randalljohnson.com. You know, um, I teach locally, we, you know, in a brick and mortar here in, in Portland, but um, we, uh, we've transferred uh, obviously into uh, online as well. But uh, I, I teach and I critique scripts and all that kind of stuff, you know, privately as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun. So maybe I'll see you down the road. Just thank you, Randall. It's been it's been a wonderful experience. You're, you sound like a true inspiration. I'm really grateful you were here today doing this. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Greg. And I and I I really dig what you guys are doing in a short amount of time. I've been really impressed with how big and and comprehensive ISA has gotten. It's great. Oh, cheers. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. This is the team. It's the whole team yeah. that you're looking at. That's that's, yeah, that's, where, great, guys. that's how you it's know. happened. Thanks again, everybody. Jaron, Molly, Scott, Carissa, Shana, Felicity, Craig, Randall, 